Hi, welcome everybody. My name is Pastor David Elijah, and we are New Millennium Kingdom Church, based out of Mission, Texas. Tonight's service, we're going to cover a subject in the Bible that is called the seed of the serpent. In the book of Genesis, God spoke about the seed of the serpent, and that's a very strange statement. So we're going to explore that through the scriptures and try to understand what was God saying when he told Satan about the seed of the serpent. So let's start. Let's go to the scriptures. The title of this message is, Who is the Seed of the Serpent in Genesis chapter 3? So let's go. In Genesis 3, God curses the serpent, Satan, in the following words. Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. Upon your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. So God cursed Satan because Satan tempted Eve to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God had commanded both Adam and Eve not to touch. And Satan came and tempted Eve and made her to fall into sin. And that's how sin entered the world, because of temptation. And now God got upset with Satan. He got upset with Adam and with Eve, because they crossed the line. They broke God's commandment. So first of all, he cursed Satan. And then he told also the woman. And he says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. This was a prophetic uh, verse regarding Jesus, where Satan would bruise Jesus on his heel through crucifixion, but that Jesus would crush the head of the serpent, Satan. Now, most Christians understand the seed of the woman to be referring to Jesus, because <clears throat> God had intended for Jesus to be born of man through the seed of the woman and to come into this world as a human being. So, the seed of the woman is referring to Jesus. But who is the seed of the serpent? How is it that Satan has seed? Because the woman has seed, through her seed, a baby is born in her womb, and then a child is born. But how does Satan have seed? And that's a very interesting question. Because a lot of people, when they read that, they are trying to understand, what is God trying to say? Seed of the serpent? What does that mean? Let's go through the scriptures and try to understand that. In John chapter 8, verse 31, it says here, hold on one second, let me see. Okay. John chapter 8, verse 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and have now been in bondage to anyone, and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, Whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So Jesus was making a very clear distinction that those who are slaves of sin, they will not be in the house of God. They will not be in the presence of God. But only a son, a true son, an obedient son, an obedient daughter of God will abide with God and in his house forever. And it's only Jesus, the Son, who can set us free from our sins. And then we are truly free. Verse 37. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me, 
because my word has no place in you. So Jesus was telling the Jews of that day that yes, y'all think y'all are the children of Abraham, but you are murderers, you'll want to kill me. And the words that Jesus spoke, they were not receiving it. They were rejecting him, they were rejecting his message. And he was saying, you also want to kill me for this word that I'm speaking. Verse 38, I speak what I have seen with my father and you do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. <clears throat> but now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. So Jesus was telling them that God Almighty is Abraham's father, he's my father, but he is not your father. You have another father. And they were trying to understand, what, what is he talking about? Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? because you are not able to listen to my word. And then now Jesus talks to them and explains who they really are. Even though they were the descendants of Abraham, he calls them something else. Verse 44, You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. So Jesus was calling them the sons of the devil. And they were, he was telling them that Satan is your father. Not God, but Satan. The devil is your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore you do not hear because you are not of God. So the Lord makes a very clear distinction that those who love the truth and those who love God and those who belong to God, they believe the truth, they hear the words of Jesus, they receive it, they apply it, and they walk in it. But those that are the children of the devil, they are liars, they are murderers, they are haters, they are backbiters, and they do not receive the truth, they reject the truth, they fight the truth, and they don't want the truth. They love lies, they love deception, they love manipulation, and they are called the children of the devil, and the devil is called the father of lies. Anyone you come across that lies all the time is a child of the devil. Liars will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because their father is the devil, and he's the father of lies, and liars belong to Satan. And the language of lies is the language of Satan. So you must understand when you have somebody that constantly lies to you to your face, trying to manipulate you, trying to deceive you, trying to, you know, put the wool over your eyes, it's because they want something out of you. And they don't care about the truth. It's all about power. They want to control you. They want to manipulate you. They will smooth talk you. They will flatter you. They will just try to make you feel good. But they are not from God. They are not speaking truth. Truth is hard, truth is bitter, truth is difficult to swallow, but truth sets you free. And this includes false teachers, false prophets, false you know, ministers, so-called of the gospel. They're preaching another gospel. They're preaching a false gospel. They're preaching a new age gospel. These are messengers of Satan. So even in the house of God, even in the church, even in the time of Jesus, these so-called Pharisees and Sadducees and all these people who are religious people, God told them straight to their face that you are the children of the devil. Acts chapter 13 verse 6. And this is what God in the book of Genesis was saying. These are called the seed of the serpent. They are the children of the serpent. Acts 13 verse 6. Now when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a wizard, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. 
but El Elimas, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So you see a man here who's a wizard. He's trying to come against Paul and, and Barnabas because they are preachers of truth. And you have a wizard that's coming against them, trying to influence the ruler of that region. Verse 8. But Elimas, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Paul and Barnabas was trying to preach the faith in Jesus Christ, and this sorcerer was trying to turn this powerful man away from the faith. So what did Saul do, who was called Paul later on? Verse 9. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him, at Elimas the sorcerer, verse 10, and said, O full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? So Paul was not being nice to this man. He was calling him the son of the devil publicly, openly, in front of the, the proconsul or the governor of that region and called him the son of the devil. He, he's like, oh, Paul was being mean. He was being rude. He was being so nasty. Why was he saying that? But the Bible says here that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And through the Holy Spirit, he called Elimas the sorcerer the son of the devil. He identified him as someone that does not belong to God, but was serving Satan. And he was an enemy of all righteousness. And he told him to his face, Will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? We are in a day and age where we are surrounded by people that are like that. They oppose the truth. They come against the word of God. They want to pervert the straight ways of the Lord. When we preach righteousness, when we preach repentance, when we preach holiness, when we preach obedience, those that are opposed to all of that, they will come against you. They will speak against you. They will hate you. They will attack you. They will malign you. They will gossip. They will backstab you. They will be traitors. These are the sons of the devil. These are the daughters of the devil. They don't belong to God. They are owned by Satan. They are the seed of the serpent. Verse 11, And now, indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So Paul had to do a miraculous sign and to curse this man, so that he will be blinded for a time and to walk away and not try to oppose Saul because Saul was speaking the truth. He was an apostle. Jesus had made Paul an apostle and he had certain authority and power and dominion even over human beings, even to openly reject and rebuke false teachers and, and wizards and sorcerers and he cursed him. He didn't try to show him the love of Christ and be nice to him and make him feel good and this is what the New Age Gospel does. Goes to wicked people and pats them on the back and say, Hey, great job. You're a great person. You are a good person and God loves you and He has a plan for your life. And they never confront sin in somebody's life. That's a sign of a false teacher, a sign of a false prophet. But they're only talking sweet stuff to you. Here you see Paul openly confront this wizard and tell him to his face that you are the son of the devil. You're the seed of the serpent. Those who do not do the will of God, but live in sin, are the devil's seed. Isaiah 57 verse 3 But come here, you sons of the sorceress, or you sons of the witch, you offspring of the adulterer and the harlot. Whom do you ridicule? Against whom do you make a wide mouth and stick out the tongue? Are you not children of transgression, offspring of falsehood? inflaming yourselves with gods under every green tree, slaying the children in the valleys under the clefts of the rocks. So God is calling forth even the children of the sorcerer and the sorceress and saying, even y'all are cursed because your father and your mother is a witch or a wizard. And look at you. You also are a mocker. You're a scorner. 
you are opening your mouth wide and you are speaking ugly stuff and you are sticking out your tongue and you are children of transgression. You are the offspring of falsehood. You were born in a lie. You were born in iniquity. You were born with deception and manipulation. And now you are doing witchcraft. You are under every tree making all kinds of sacrifices and you are killing the children in the valleys. You see it with abortion clinics across this country. How many 50 million children, babies have been aborted? What is happening here? It's not just, oh, it's my right to choose or whatever. It's a blood sacrifice to Satan, the ones who kill their own babies. They're doing violence against their own wombs. Why? Just so that they can live a sinful lifestyle. And that's happening across this country. It's a horrible tragedy and nobody talks about it. And these same people that want the right to have abortions are trying to fight for Black Lives Matter and they're such big hypocrites. They will not defend a baby in the womb, but they want to defend some criminal rioters and looters on the street, destroying the cities and saying, oh, they have the rights and we have to protect those rights. This country is full of these hypocrites. that They kill their own babies. They murder the baby in the womb. They abort their own child. And now they're standing as righteous people and being hypocrites openly, publicly and saying, look, look, these black lives, they, their lives matter. No, all lives matter. Start with the womb first or you can take a stand against other races or whatever you want to do. Start with the womb. But these hypocrites don't want to do that. Why? Because they're the seed of the serpent. People that are lawless, that are just doing whatever they feel like, just out of control. These are the seed of the serpent. And we are seeing it manifest right now in this nation, in this land. Colossians chapter 3 verse 5. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. People that are out there lawless and just doing whatever and they think, yeah, I can do whatever I want and, and opening their mouth and cursing and doing all this junk and they have evil desires and passions and they are in fornication, adultery, all these kind of things. The Bible says the wrath of God is coming upon these people. These are the sons of disobedience. These are the sons of Satan. Verse 7, In which you yourselves once walked, when you lived in them. So we were also at one time, before we were saved, before God came into our lives, we were the same. We were the sons of disobedience. We were the children of wrath. We were the seed of the serpent. We were doing exactly what Satan wanted us to do. We were living in sin. We were living in wickedness. We were doing all the wicked things that this world offers. And then God came and he rescued us out of that ugly lifestyle. That's why it says, in which you yourselves once walked. In the past, you did the same thing. Now you don't. That's the difference. Now you're a child of God. God rescued you out of that wickedness. Verse 8, But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. So Paul is instructing the church. He says, Look, now walk in the right way. Now do the right thing. Now obey God and His word. Romans chapter 1, verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. God's eyes are upon this planet, seven and a half billion people, and God knows exactly those men and women that are suppressing the truth and they're walking in unrighteousness, they're walking in wickedness, they're walking in their evil ways, and they're coming against people of God. God's wrath is going to be revealed from heaven. When the Lord comes back upon this earth, His wrath is going to come upon this earth. When He came first time, He came to die on the cross as the Lamb of God, to sacrifice Himself for our wickedness and our sins, our iniquities, all our nasty ways. This time when He's coming, He's coming with the wrath of God against all disobedience, all rebellion, all unrighteousness. And those who are actively coming against the truth of God's word. When we go across the the land and we preach this gospel whoever comes against us the wrath of God is upon them and we have had to warn these people to their faces that do not suppress the truth do not promote unrighteousness do not promote wickedness don't be worshiping wicked men and women but they want to keep doing it in their rebellious ugly nasty ways 
But the wrath of God is abiding on their head because they're doing that. Verse 19. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So even wicked people know that God is there, that God is the creator of all things. He's the creator of the universe. Even unbelievers and atheists and, and ungodly people are fully aware of God. They just ignore Him. They avoid Him. They don't talk about Him. And they will tell you too, don't talk to me about Jesus and don't talk about me, to me about God and don't mention the Bible. These are people, their conscience is bothered. They know God exists. They know God is real. But they suppress and they block and they come against aggressively against truth. Verse 21, Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful. These are ungrateful people. They just glorifying themselves. They have no you know, reason to, to glorify God in their life. And what happens to them? They became futile in their thoughts or foolish in their thoughts. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Darkness enters these people because they reject the light of God. They reject the truth of God. Now all they have left is darkness. And you can see it in their eyes. You can see it in their faces. They're trying to put makeup and they're trying to put all kinds of creams and lotions and beauty treatments and all this stuff. And they cannot hide their darkness. Verse 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness. Finally, God gets tired of people like that and He just hands them over. He says, go ahead. You want to go and be a nasty individual? Go for it. And then wait for my wrath to come upon you because you are continuously being wicked. You're continuously doing wrong things. You're continuously practicing evil. It says what? In the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Sexual sin, sexual immorality, all kinds of sexual wickedness. They have defiled their bodies and their souls and their minds and their thoughts who exchange the truth of God for the lie. See, these people lie to themselves. They convince themselves that I'm good and I'm perfect. Nothing wrong with me. I can still sin and do whatever. It's all secret sins and hidden sins. Nobody knows about it. I can hate in my heart and I can just want to have malice and evil thoughts and intentions against other people. And I'm good. Nobody knows. I can smile and put on a show and act like a person that is very well-spoken and well-dressed and good-looking and good perfume. And, you know, they put the lipstick on the pig. And they think, oh, the pig looks so nice. But it's it's a falsehood. It's a deception. You have to call a pig a pig, even if it has lipstick on it. And worship and serve the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to wild passions. See, people are defined by their passions. They're defined by their lifestyle. They're defined by their attitudes. You cannot deceive anybody right now. Whatever you are, whoever you are, it's obvious. You should listen to the people around you. They will tell you exactly who you are. Don't try to fool yourself. Don't try to deceive yourself or to try to deceive others. You should have open ears to hear what other people are saying about you and say, oh, you know what? Let me pay attention. Let me not continue being a hypocrite and live a lie. I must live according to the truth. And whoever's telling you the truth, they are your best friend. You may hate them, but if they're telling you the truth, they're saying it for your benefit. When we go about telling people the truth, it's not to hate on them or be rude or mean or ugly or whatever. Truth is truth. It's hard, it's bitter, it's difficult to swallow, but it will set you free. Truth has power to change and transform your life. We've seen it over and over again. That's why we are faithful to the truth, to declare it and to be a witness of it and to see the result of it and rejoice in it because it's amazing. How truth can just transform someone's life. But those who are liars and cowards and hypocrites and nasty individuals, we say get lost because your wickedness will affect us. Your evil ways will influence us and our children. We have to be very careful. It says, For even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, verse 27, leaving the natural use of the woman, 
burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful. He's talking about homosexuality and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. What happens to people that practice this? They get HIV, they get depressed, they get suicidal, they kill themselves. That is the punishment on them for what they've done. Verse 28, And even as they did not li like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, full of murder, full of strife, full of deceit, full of evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Wow, that's a big list. And you are in a society that's filled with people like that right now. They hate God and this is their true nature. And that's why the wrath of God is coming. The judgments of God is coming upon this earth in the most violent way, the most catastrophic way. Celestial events are coming. Asteroids are coming to strike the earth. Tsunamis are coming. Earthquakes are coming. Volcanoes are going to erupt. Massive events are going to take place. The false teacher, the false preacher, the Joel Osteens of this world, they're just going to tell you your best life now. It's the worst time of your life right now. Stop listening to New Age false gospel preachers that are going to burn in hell forever. How do you know they're going to burn in hell? They never mention Jesus. They never mention repentance. They never mention holiness. They never mention obedience. They never talk about wickedness. They, they flip the gospel around and make it sound like God is a Santa Claus. He's there to bless you and give you all the best of your life now and all this garbage. They have never read the book of Revelation of what God intends for this planet when he returns. The day of the Lord is a very dangerous day for humanity. Verse 31, 32. Who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. See, this is a horrible group of people. They themselves are walking in wickedness, and then they're also approving other wicked people. You may have people like that in your family. They're living a wicked lifestyle. They have evil ways, evil thoughts, evil intentions, and then they're approving other wicked men and women and honoring wicked people around them. These are disgusting, despicable human beings. They're garbage individuals. You need to identify them, call it out, oppose it, and you know, come against it with all your strength. Because these are people that are proof of those who practice the same wickedness that they are doing. I can name names and put people to shame, but they don't even have shame. So it's pointless even mentioning names because they are shameless individuals. They have no conscience, they have no guilt, no shame, no condemnation, no conviction of sin. These are people in complete delusion. Wickedness has overtaken them. The darkness has overtaken them. You can see it in their faces. They look like zombies. They look like ghosts. And they are manifesting right now. If you come across people like that in your life, in your family, the wickedness is rising to the surface because Satan's time is short. The sons of the devil, the daughters of the devil are fully manifesting right now. And they will come against you. They will hate you with all their force, all their might, all their strength. And you're like, wow, what's going on right now? What is going on? We live in strange times. What is going on? It's because we are in the last hour. These things have to, have to take place. Their wickedness has to come fully to the surface for God's wrath to come upon them. You are just there as a target for them. Because you're a Christian, you're a believer, you love God, you become their target. Anyone that makes you a target, those people are the seed of the serpent. The serpent comes to bite. The serpent comes very sneakily and from the side and then suddenly lashes out and suddenly attacks you and suddenly, you know, vomits on you. And like, whoa, what just happened? It's the seed of the serpent. Don't be surprised. You're surrounded by the seed of the serpent right now. And they are rising up. The Antichrist spirit is fully functional and operating in this planet right now. The Antichrist himself will be revealed very shortly. And the church will witness the revealing of the Antichrist. Read your Bible. 
A lot of people saying, oh, we'll be out of here and the rapture will take place and we'll... No, you won't. Otherwise, why will God cut short the days? He said he'll do it for the sake of the elect. If the elect are still here, only then the days are going to be cut short. If the rapture takes place before the Antichrist shows up, why would God need to cut short the days? You must read the Bible and fully understand the timing and the season. The church will be here for the revealing of the Antichrist. Romans 5.12 Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. Sin brings death. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says. And that's another thing that if you have sin in your life and you don't confess it, you will be miserable, you'll be sad, you'll be oppressed, you'll be depressed, you'll be suicidal because of unconfessed sin. Nothing can fix that. No alcohol, no drugs, no womanizing, nothing will fix that. It's your sin nature that you are struggling with. If you're suicidal, it's because your sin has overtaken you. Don't blame this or that or your family history or whatever. It's your own sin. That is making you miserable. And the best way out of it is confession of your sin. Repentance of your sin. Asking God's forgiveness of your sin. The Bible says blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven. The prosperity preacher says oh blessed are you because you have a car and a house and a bank balance. That's garbage teaching. You can be full of sin. You can be like King Herod. Wicked as hell. He had the house. He had the chariots. He had all the admirers and everything. And God sent an angel of death to strike him dead in the midst of his prosperity and all his wealth and everything. That is not a sign of blessing. In this country, they have turned blessing into monetary gain. That's what the prosperity preacher preaches all the time. These are messengers of Satan. These are the seed of the serpent in the house of God, in the church, in the body of Christ, contaminating and defiling the body with false teachings, false doctrines. Read the scriptures. Don't be lazy. Don't just sit in front of a television set and just listen to any garbage that comes out of it and believe everything and say amen and hallelujah to anything that these people are vomiting in your face. Open up your own Bible. Compare it to what is being preached. Ask the Holy Spirit to make you understand what the Bible says. Don't just believe anything and everything that the garbage is throwing out on Christian television. And we're talking about Christian television. We're not talking about secular media and Fox News and NBC and ABC, those are propaganda machines. They're there to program your mind to be slaves to the system, to be slaves to the federal government. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. For those who want to go deeper in that, understand what is Operation Mockingbird. It's a propaganda machine set up by the CIA to brainwash the American people. It is still active right now. That operation is still functioning. It is still being used in every election cycle to brainwash the American mind. Go deeper into that and understand what's going on. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 5. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. God makes a very clear distinction. Wicked people have no inheritance. But I have a fancy house and I have a big truck and I'm a hater and I love myself and I'm a narcissist. Yeah, you have all of that now on this earth in this time. That's it. That's all you're going to get. But you have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. God looks at the heart. He doesn't look at the outward appearance. Oh, I'm so good looking and I'm so handsome and I'm so physically fit and I'm so pretty and I'm so vain. Yeah, God doesn't look at any of that. He looks straight into your heart. If your heart is black as death, death is coming for you. Verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Flattery will kill you. Don't let people come to you with empty words. Don't have liars around you. Don't have deceivers around you. Don't have manipulators around you. We keep saying that. Separate yourself. Don't keep the company of pigs and dogs. And we're not talking about animals here. Why? Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Verse 7, Therefore, do not be partakers with them. So are we saying something opposite to what the scripture is saying to us? 
the Bible says it very clearly. It doesn't say, please don't hang around with these people. It says, therefore. Therefore means understand what has been said before. And now when you understand it, therefore, do not be partakers with them. Because if you partake with them, you will also partake with the wrath of God that's coming upon them. We keep warning the sheep. We keep warning the people of God. We keep warning the church. Do not hang around with the wicked. Don't hang around with evil people. Don't hang around with abusive men, womanizers, alcoholics, drug addicts. All these people are messed up. Do not be around them. They are pigs. But if you still enjoy their company, then maybe you are a pig. We keep telling that to people that, hello, if you're so comfortable with wicked, nasty people, defiled, contaminated people, then maybe you are just like them. Then that means then the wrath of God is even upon you. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. It's very difficult to walk with God. It's very difficult and challenging to obey God. It's very difficult to obey God in tough situations, in challenging situations, when you're all cut off, you're all by yourself, you're all alone. Nobody cares about you. Nobody calls you. Nobody bothers. Yeah, that's the walk. You have to pay that price. But no, I don't like that. I want to hang out with the nasty people so I can have fun and laugh and joke and have a good time. This country is so caught up with having a good time. But those who walk with God, it's not good times anymore. It's challenging times. It's tough times. It's battle. But that's the price you pay. And when the Lord returns, He will say, Well done, good and faithful servant. You serve me. You didn't serve wicked man. You didn't serve society. You didn't serve the culture of the day. You didn't serve the traditions of men. You served me, the living Christ, the Son of the living God. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He's returning very soon. But we must be ready with our walk, not just with our words. Our walk is critical. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. When we were sinners, we were wicked, we were dead, we were zombies. We didn't know God, we didn't know Christ, we didn't know the Holy Spirit. We had no conviction of sin. We didn't feel any guilt for doing wrong things. We just did it. And we laughed about it and we thought it was funny. But He made us alive. Now when you're alive by the Spirit, you cannot go back to the old ways. You cannot do the bad things. You can't continue in the old lifestyle. And if you do, then you, maybe you're not alive in Christ. You're still dead in your trespasses. You're still dead in your sins. Verse 2. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So the prince of the power of the air, Satan, Beelzebub, the devil, is the one who controls this world. He controls and influences, manipulates the sons of disobedience. He works in them. There's going to always be a clash between the sons of the kingdom and the sons of disobedience. There's no peace to be made. You cannot make peace with the enemy. You cannot compromise with demonic, demonized, nasty individuals. When somebody comes and gives you advice and say, Oh, just be nice and, and be courteous and be politically correct. They are also messengers of Satan. Because they are on the side of the devil. They are not on the side of God. They don't care about the other person. They are just talking about their feelings and their emotions and that's it. They live in the flesh. They live in the soul. They have no clue of how to walk in the Spirit of God. Verse 3, Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. If you still have that attitude that, oh, my flesh is ruling and my soul is ruling and my lust is ruling and my mind is in control, you are by nature children of wrath, just as the others. You're no better than the others. So he's like, wow, what do I do then? Well, get your flesh crucified. Get your soul under the subjection of the Holy Spirit. Renew your mind with the Word of God. You cannot continue your old ways and think, oh yeah, I'm fine because I made a confession. No, you are ch nature by nature the children of wrath. Examine your own nature. Before you get all, you get all, all self-righteous and pointing fingers and this one, that one, look at your own nature, see how wretched you are, and ask for God's mercy and forgiveness. Verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love, with which He loved us, 
even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. So it's because of God's mercy. It's because of God's grace. It's because of his great love. That's why we were dead in trespasses. We were wicked as hell. And he made us alive with Christ. If you are born again, you're born of the Holy Spirit. You're born of Christ. He's made you alive. It's the work of God. You didn't make yourself alive. You didn't just suddenly were born on this planet and say, I'm such a good guy and I'm such a good person. And because I'm such a good person, I'm a Christian. No, it's not because of your goodness. It's not because of your nature. By nature, you were the children of wrath. By nature, you were dead in your trespasses. There's no good person. There's no saint on this earth. There's no righteous person. There's no person that can say, I'm a good person. Any hypocrite that comes to us and says, I'm a good guy. No, you're not. You're a jackass. If you believe that and you expect us to believe that. And if we believe that, then we are jackasses. And there are plenty of these jackasses walking around saying, I'm a good person. I'm a good guy. Oh, let me come into your house. Let me deceive all of you because I'm a good guy. No, you're not. You're a pig. Verse 6. And he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It's God who does that. He takes us out of the pit. He takes us out of that muck and that dirt and that poop. He picks us up. He cleans us up. He washes us in the blood of Jesus. And then he makes us to be seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's the work of God. That is salvation. It's a supernatural work. It's not done by human will or by human methods. It's a supernatural work of God. Salvation is by Christ alone, by faith in Him alone, through the power of the Holy Spirit and through believing on His Word. It's not based on some dream or some vision or some prophecy or some clouds in the sky. No, it's based on the foundation of the doctrine of the Word of God. If you don't know the Bible and you saw some dream and vision, you are a messed up person. You cannot base your faith upon some vision or some dream. Right now, there are plenty of people online, on YouTube, oh, I had a vision, oh, I had a dream, and they don't even have no clue about the Bible because when they open their mouth, they're just talking about some experience they had, and it's not based out of the Word of God. They are very badly deceived. Verse 7, that in the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. So that realization has to come. You know what? I was dead in my sins. I was dead in my trespasses. I was the most worst of the worst wicked sinner. And then Christ made me alive. God the Father showed his love upon me. He came and stepped in. And he's the author and the finisher of my faith. Salvation is a supernatural act of the grace and mercy and the love of God. If God would not step into your life, you would still be a wretched, miserable, nasty individual and the wrath of God would abide on you. Verse 10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. So what does God do? He takes the seed of the serpent that we used to be and He turns us around and makes us His workmanship. Now we are children of God now. We are no more the seed of the serpent. We all by nature are the children of wrath. Through Adam, through the sin of Eve, we all are sinners. We all were born in iniquity. We came into this world sinners, wicked as hell. And then God turns it around. We become born again, born of the Spirit, born of Christ, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has already done the good works. He says, step into it and walk in it. There will be challenges. There will be battles. There will be op opposition. There will be wicked people opposing you. Go press on right through. I will give you the victory. I prepared the, the blessing for you ahead of you. But press on. Walk by faith. Overcome all things through the blood of Jesus, through the testimony that you have. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea, in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans. So don't be surprised when you suffer for Christ, when you're under attack, when you're under persecution. And there's more persecution coming. Antichrist will come and persecute the church and he will kill some of us. Some of us will become martyrs for Christ. Just like in the early church days, that same attacks are going to come. 
The persecuted church in China, in India, in Africa, in the Middle East, it's already under persecution. The Antichrist spirit is already killing Christians across the world. It's just in the West that everybody's comfortable and thinking, oh, we're just going to take the bus and get out of here and nothing's going to happen. No, the persecution has already come to this land now in the West. 20% of churches in this country are already completely shut down, never to reopen. Think about it, 20%. That's a big chunk of people that have no access to any church anymore. And those pastors, preachers, I don't know what they're going to do. Verse 15, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us and they do not please God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. These are people that oppose the gospel. They oppose men and women of God. The Bible says from the uttermost, from the highest of the highest heavens, wrath is going to come upon these people. If you preach the gospel, you're faithful to the name of Jesus, you are a witness of Christ, and anybody that opposes you and tells you don't speak about Jesus and I'm going to come against you, the wrath of God is going to come upon them. And don't be intimidated. Don't be allowed by others to try to shut you down. Don't be a coward. This is the time to stand up and say, you know what, even if you are ready to kill me, I'm going to speak about Jesus. I'm going to be a faithful witness to Jesus Christ. That is what God is coming back for. A glorious, faithful bride, a warrior bride, faithful until the end, faithful until death, overcoming all things. He doesn't like cowards. He doesn't like whiners and grumblers and complainers. Get out of that circle if you are in that circle. Start growing a spine. Start finding your backbone and stop lying. You think you're lying and you can fool others? You can't. And even if you're very good, you're a good liar, it makes no difference. The wrath of God is already on your head. God knows you. He has marked you for death. So stop your lies. Stop speaking the language of the devil and start walking in truth. However painful, however difficult, however challenging, it doesn't matter. Walk the walk. Pay the price. If you're the only one on the earth right now that is supposed to do that, do it. That's what Noah did. And he survived because he stood against an entire wicked generation. And that's what God is looking for. And he said it, he prophesied it himself of his own return. He says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be for the return of the coming of the Son of Man. Be ready for the return of the Son of Man. And be like Noah, standing one individual and his family against an entire generation that was going to get wiped out. We are in such times. Be like Noah. Noah's example for us. The destruction came and those people had no clue. That destruction is right at the doorstep right now. Be like Noah. Be prepared for the return of Jesus and the destruction that's coming upon the earth. And even if you're the only one, the only witness left, take that stand. Be faithful to Christ, and he will come back and say, Well done. Revelation twenty two twelve, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. God knows your works. He knows your attitude. He knows your lifestyle. He knows your thoughts. He knows everything. He's coming back to reward you or to judge you. He's going to bless you or he's going to curse you. It's your choice. Make that choice. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day you say, I decide to obey God all the way until the end. Even if I become the most unpopular person, the most hated person on this earth, I don't care. Because I'm going to pay that price because Jesus requires me to pay that price. It's a commandment. It's not a choice. This is not a democracy. This is a kingdom. He is the king of kings. He is coming back to judge all nations. The Father has given him all power, all authority, all dominion. And he's going to come to judge his church first. The judgment of God begins with the house of God first. That's why we preach like this to the church. We're not preaching to unbelievers. This message is going out to believers to get their act together, to get their spiritual house in order, to start obeying God. They've played church for too long. They've played games for too long. They've been a hypocrite for too long. The time has come to give an account to God. Get your life straightened out. Get it cleaned up. Get rid of the junk. Get rid of all the nasty stuff. Get rid of unclean objects in your house. You got occult activity going on in your house because you got occult objects in your house. I'm talking to some people right now. 
We can go into a list of so many things that you have that God has been telling you, the Holy Spirit has been convicting you. Get rid of those things in your house. It could be familiar objects, things that people gave you, that you covet, that you say, oh, it's valuable, i got to keep it. And that's causing ugliness to come into your life. It's ca causing darkness to come into your life. It's causing ca chaos, confusion, conflict to come into your life. Get rid of those objects. Stuff that your ex-boyfriends gave and ex-girlfriends gave and the stuff that you want to hoard and keep in a box in the closet somewhere in the back, get rid of that. That's a legal stronghold in your life. Satan is using that against you. Verse 13, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. These are the ones who are blessed. They're not blessed because say, look, Lord, I've got a nice house. I bought a nice truck. I got a nice big bank balance. That's not the entry point into God's kingdom and his city. Blessed are those who do his commandments. You got to tell rich people and think people who have a lot of stuff, slap them across their face and say, your stuff is not going to get you into God's kingdom. You're going to, you know, you're going to die. You're going to go to six feet down into the ground. You can't take any of your stuff with you. And you will not have the right to the tree of life and you will not be able to enter through the gates of his city unless you're obedient to his commandments. I don't care how rich you are, how much money you have, how much stuff you have, whatever you have, your intelligence, your, your wisdom, your knowledge, your good looks, whatever, it's not going to get you into his city. Obedience to his commandments is going to give you access. Verse 15, But outside are dogs, and sorcerers, and sexually immoral, and murderers, and idolaters. And whoever loves and practices a lie. God's very clear. The new millennial kingdom will come, and outside will be the dogs, and the liars, and the sexually immoral, the witches, the wizards, the sorcerers, murderers, idolaters. Idolaters are narcissists. Narcissists, lovers of self. And whoever loves and practices a lie. 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. And this is, look, the commandment is to the churches. God is not speaking to unbelievers. He's not talking to the wicked world. He already has reserved judgment on them, just like in the days of Noah. He's going to wipe out a whole chunk of humanity. These are warnings to the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bride and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts, Come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Examine your heart and say, What are my desires? What is my passions? What is, what is my demands that I'm making? Am I desiring to drink of the water of life freely? Or am I chasing after stuff and petty stuff and little things and, and all the little, little stuff? Those who get caught up with little stuff, they are turkeys. They just get caught up. The little chickens. They're doing that all day, every day. They have chicken minds. They don't see the big picture. They don't see what God is about to do. They're not thirsty for the water of life. They're not desiring of the Holy Spirit. They're just caught up in their own little petty spirit, fighting over little things and getting caught up in the petty stuff. These are people that you got to say, you know what, get lost. Because you don't see. You're blind. Matthew chapter 12, verse 30. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. This is how you know the true third church of Christ. When you are in love with Jesus, the church comes together. But if you are against God, you will scatter abroad. You will run away. And now what do you see in churches? 90% of people have run away from the church. They've scattered abroad. Because they never love Jesus. And if they don't love Jesus, they are against Him. He knows who loves Him and He knows who are against Him. The world is divided into those who love God, who love Jesus, who love His commandments, who love Him and worship Him and walk with Him. And the ones who hate Him, who are against Him and who have been scattered all over the place. John chapter 3, verse 36. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life. But what happens? But the wrath of God abides on him. 
It boils down to one thing. Do you love Jesus? Do you love the Son? Do you believe in the Son? And do you walk by the power of His Holy Spirit? Do you walk in love and joy and peace and goodness and mercy? Or are you full of hate and anger and resentment and bitterness and unforgiveness and all the sins that are eating you alive? It's like a cancer inside your body. And on top of that, the wrath of God is, is on top of you. John 15, 3. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Why do we keep repeating the scriptures? As you hear the word of God, as you listen to it and you receive it, that word cleanses you. It cleanses your soul. It cleanses your mind. It cleanses your emotions. It blesses you. That's why we do like a one hour service of the word of God. We're not just giving opinions and trying to please you and try to entertain you and make you laugh and tell you jokes. And those are clowns. Those are not preachers of righteousness. And there are plenty of them in the churches. And those churches are already shut down because they were entertainment centers. They were not churches. But Jesus says what? You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, Neither can you unless you abide in me. Your purpose should be, Lord, I want to abide in your presence. I want to be with you. I want to always desire you. I always want to seek your face. Get rid of all the false de demands and desires and lusts and whatever that's occupying your mind right now. And you're so caught up with it and you're so paranoid about it and obsessing over it. Just break free from that. That's a vicious cycle you're in. You're trapped in the worldly system of the way that the world thinks. Society makes you think in a certain way, which is a messed up way of thinking. Break free from that. Vanity is an ugly thing. It traps you in a vicious cycle. And God is saying, come above that and abide in me. Verse 5, I am the wine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. There are people spinning their wheels and trying to fix things and find solutions and do stuff and move forward, make progress, all kinds of things without Christ. You are not going to accomplish much. Yeah, with your human strength, you may accomplish some things, little things, few things, insignificant things. But in Him, you can accomplish a lot. But without Him, you can do nothing. So a lot of people feel their life is meaningless, their life is hopeless, their life is depressed, their life is sad, their life is miserable, and they're suicidal and they're messed up because they're doing everything. They try to live their life without Christ. They're not going to accomplish anything. They feel like a failure. They feel like a loser. They feel like, I've not done anything in this world. I've not left a legacy. I've not accomplished anything. I've not done anything of significance. I feel useless. I feel like a loss. I feel like like nothing because it is everything is outside of Christ that's why verse 6 if anyone does not abide in me he is cast out as a branch and is withered you see people that are withered they are dried out they are all sucked out they have no life they're walking around like living zombies because they do not abide in Christ they look messed up they're emotionally bankrupt they're completely oppressed and depressed and completely messed up taking different types of drugs and prescription pills and all kinds of things to try to revive themselves. They have to drink 24 bottles of beer and alcohol to, to get some life into them. Without that, they're just like, like living dead because they don't abide in Christ. They don't drink the living water freely. It's free. You don't have to go to a bar and pay tons of money to drink alcohol. Just lift up your hands to heaven and let the Holy Spirit fill you. Let the anointing of God revive you in your soul, your heart, your emotions, your thoughts. Only God can re-transform your body and your soul and your thoughts and your emotions. It's only the anointing that breaks every yoke of bondage, every stronghold in your life, every curse in your life, every iniquity, the power of iniquity, the power of lawlessness on your life. Only God can break it. You must welcome the Holy Spirit. You must ask Him to come, Lord. Set me free. I tried it in my own strength and I fail miserably and I keep failing and failing because I'm, tr I'm trying to apply the wrong solution. The only way is to abide in you. The only way is to come to you. The only way is to fall down at your feet. 
If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. This is what's happening to a lot of the older people, a generation of lawless people. They're dying all by themselves, all alone in the hospitals, not able to connect with their family members, completely cut off because of a virus, and they're dying alone, sad, miserable deaths. Horrible way to die. Cut off from your own loved ones, cut off from everybody. You can't even have somebody hold your hand while you take your last breath. That's a horrible way to die. They're trying to FaceTime and trying to do it online. That's not good enough. Looking at somebody that you love far away on a little tiny screen, that's not how you die. That's not a good way to die. There are thousands and thousands of people dying like that. And it's the older generation, a generation that was faithless, that disobeyed God, that did not follow God, that did not obey God. They turned their back on God, and now they've been cut off, and they've been thrown into the fire, and they're burned. Second Peter 2 9. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. God does both things. He delivers the godly out of temptations and he also reserves the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. God has reserved a certain day for the unjust and the wicked and the ungodly. The day of judgment is for the ungodly, it's for the wicked, it's for the seed of the serpent. But those who've committed their life to Christ, those who've obeyed God all the way, not halfway, not compromised, not in a you know half-baked way, but all the way. It's all or nothing. You can't be sitting on the fence when it comes to your faith. You can't play church. You can't play, you know, this game and think, oh yeah, I can negotiate with God. No, there's no negotiation. You hand over your life to Christ. You give up your life for Him and then you gain back your life. You can't play this game. There are people struggling with God and wrestling with God and saying, oh, my way or no, I won't do this because you're not doing this for me and I'm not doing this for you. And they're playing this game with God and God's just laughing at them. So that's not how it works. Either you surrender yourself fully to me and see my power come into your life or you play these games for the rest of your life and another day I will say, I don't know you. Verse 10. And especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous and self-willed. That's how you know these are children of wrath. They're presumptuous. They're self-willed. Their will is very strong. Like it's, I want to do it in my way. And, and that's not a good thing. They despise authority. When preachers come and tell them, repent and believe in God and stop your disobedience, stop, they come against you. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. They will speak against you. They will speak against preachers. We've had people hate on us and speak against us and we're like, that's fine. We know where you will end up if you come against the truth, if you come against righteousness, if you come against the obedience that we preach. Verse 11, Whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. Even angels are careful not to speak against people of righteousness. 1 Peter 4, 12, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. This is talking to those who are learning to obey God. They're walking in obedience. They're learning to say, yes, Lord, whatever is your will, I will do it. I'm walking by faith. I'm trusting in you. I'm being attacked. I'm being persecuted. I'm being hated. I'm, people are backbiting me. They're traitorous, all of this. It says, don't be you know, amazed. Don't think it's strange. Don't get shocked like, oh my goodness, what happened? I thought my best life is going to happen now and I'm under attack and... All these crazy things are happening. And Peter says, don't worry about it. Don't think it's strange. But what do you do? But rejoice to the extent, verse 13, that you partake of Christ's sufferings. Look at it in that way. That the way Jesus suffered, he says, you will suffer also. You will be persecuted also. You would be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Don't be ashamed of him. Don't be afraid of that. Oh, I, I don't like conflict and I don't like fights and I don't like opposition and I don't like people hating on me. I want to be popular. I want to be a good person and I want to be having fun all the time. No, then you are like the world. But if you're under attack and you're walking the walk, enjoy, rejoice, 
Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You suffered. I'm getting a little taste of your suffering. I will take it. Why? Why would you do that? Who likes suffering? Who likes to? There's a reason for that. Your faith is being tested. Your character is being burned in the fire to be made like pure gold. That's the purpose of suffering. Suffering is not just so that you enjoy suffering. It's to make you understand in the wisdom of God that this trial and this suffering is to purify you, to make you holy before God, to prepare you for the glory of God that is coming. That is why you are suffering. Even Jesus suffered. He's not going to tell you to suffer unless he himself suffered first. He suffered horribly on the cross. You're not suffering like that. You're not being crucified physically on a wooden cross like Jesus did. So he has the right to tell you, go through a little bit of suffering for my name's sake. So then when I return, you will have my glory. That when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. There is joy waiting for you. Suffering is there now. Yes, Lord, I will suffer and it's hurtful and it's painful and I'm all alone and by myself and nobody's there. Yeah, I'm suffering. I'm suffering in my soul, in my mind, in my thoughts, in my body. I'm fasting, I'm seeking you, but when you return and when your glory comes, I will be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached, verse 14, for the name of Christ, blessed are you. If somebody hates you and curses you because you serve Jesus and you love Jesus and you walk with him, you obey him, you confess him and you preach his name faithfully and they hate you for it, blessed are you. Why? For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. That's amazing. Let the seed of the serpent come to attack you. Let the sons of disobedience come to hate on you. It's fine because the Holy Spirit will be resting upon you. You will feel the anointing of God. You will feel the presence of God because the seed of the serpent is coming against you. The seed of Satan is coming to attack you. The children of wrath is coming against you. The sons and daughters of disobedience are attacking you. No problem. Because the Holy Spirit is with you. On their part, he is blasphemed. But on your part, he is glorified. When we come under attack and people hate us and everything, God is glorified in that. Look, what kind of glory is there in that? Because God knows both the hearts. He knows what kind of suffering you're going through, but he's being glorified in that. Verse 15, But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evil doer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. The minute you come under attack, the minute you are suffering as a true believer, if you're suffering, like I said, because of your own garbage and your own nonsense, there's no glory in it. You will not get credit for that. But if you do the right thing, you walk in obedience and you are suffering for it, don't be ashamed of it. Don't feel all sad and miserable and shamed and, oh, Everybody hates me because I'm the only Christian here and everybody else is unbelievers and they hate me because I'm not popular and this and that and nobody likes me. Don't be ashamed. Glorify God in this matter. Look up to heaven and say, thank you, Jesus. You gave me the opportunity. It's a privilege and an honor in this age, in this generation, in the time of your return that I get to suffer for your namesake. Whatever the opposition, whatever the hatred against me, whatever family members hate on me, they are the children of wrath. What do you think? They're going to love you. Your own family members will be the enemies of your own household. So don't be surprised if your own family members are hating on you. Because Jesus said, I have come to bring a sword into your household. Because the battle is between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. You're the, if you're born of God, you're born of the Holy Spirit, you're born again, the seed of the serpent will attack you. Don't be ashamed and don't be afraid and don't be surprised. It's there. It's all there in the Bible. Read it. We are reading it for you so you understand it very clearly. Verse 17. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. Judgment has begun with us. Judge yourself severely at this time. Don't spare yourself. Say, Lord, before you come to judge me, let me judge myself. So that I will be found to be in the right order with you. This is a good time to be tough on yourself. Be a good disciple. Discipline your body. Discipline your soul. Discipline your mind. And pay that price and fast and pray and seek His face. Yeah, it's difficult to do that on a daily basis. We've been doing this for 25 years. It's not easy. 
It's sacrificial. It's painful. When we tell others to do it, they look at you like, what? I want to party. I want to have a good time. What are you talking about? Okay, then. You're going to be part of the world system. Then the wrath of God will abide on you. This is a time not to party and have a good time. This is a time to be obedient to God, pay that price, sacrificially walk, walk with Him. So when He returns, you will have exceeding joy. Exceeding joy. Not just joy, but exceeding joy. Like amazing level of joy. Because you said, you know what? I paid that price and I was disciplined. And now God is going to give me the joy of the Lord. He's going to be glad with you and you're going to be glad because, they, okay, you know what? People thought I was crazy. People thought I was mad. They thought I was a fanatic. They thought I was all this and that. But I understood by the wisdom of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that I must walk this way. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to Him in doing good as to a faithful Creator. So in the midst of all that suffering, just commit your soul. Say, here, Lord, here I am, Lord. I'm going to commit myself to you. I'm going to do your will, Lord. And be faithful to Him until the end. Why? Because the days of judgment are here. Jude chapter 1 verse 5. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward He destroyed those who did not believe. So yeah, you came out of trouble, you came out, God rescued you out of a bad situation, whatever. But afterwards, if you did not continue and you do not obey, you do not believe, He will come and destroy you. They are an example for us. The Israelites died in the wilderness because of their rebellion and disobedience, because of their grumbling and their complaining and their nasty ways. God got them out of Egypt, got them out of darkness, got them out of bondage and out of slavery. But He still destroyed them because they chose not to obey God. God is not playing games. He wants those who are genuinely obedient and disciplined and faithful and loyal to Him until the end. Verse 6. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Even the fallen angels are under judgment. They have a much more severe judgment because they are supernatural beings, but they are tied up with supernatural chains in darkness, reserved for the day of the Lord. Verse 7. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a, single, in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. We live in a land that's just like Sodom and Gomorrah. There's eternal vengeance coming. Fire is coming upon the earth. Fire, supernatural fire that will burn humanity because of their wicked ways. Likewise, also, these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. So again, God is identifying those that they have defiled their flesh, they reject the authority of God's word, and then they speak against the people of God. They will see the eternal vengeance of God through fire. Jude chapter 1 verse 14. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of His saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way. So even Enoch, in the book of Enoch, if you read it, it's an extra-biblical book, but Jude takes a verse from that book, and this is now as canon. It is scripture now, because Jude has mentioned it as a prophecy that Enoch had prophesied that when the Lord comes, He will judge the ungodly. He will come with ten thousands of His saints, but He will execute judgment upon ungodly people in their ungodly ways. He knows their deeds. He knows their actions. He knows their words. He knows their lifestyles. He's coming to judge them with vengeance. And of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against Him, those who curse Jesus, who speak against Him, all the atheists, the unbelievers, the 
the homosexual community, all these people, the wicked politicians, the rulers of this world, they have spoken against Jesus. They are angry at God. They are angry at Jesus. The Antichrist and his minions will, will come upon the earth. They have spoken against Jesus. He will destroy them all. Verse 16, these are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. The Bible keeps giving you a list of these people. It's the same list, the same kind of behavior, the same kind of attitude, the same kind of words and deeds and actions. It's not a mystery like, oh, is this a person a believer? Is he a Christian? Is he an unbeliever? What's going on? Just look at the list and you can identify. Boasters, proud, arrogant, flatterers, liars, hypocrites, manipulators, deceivers. Majority of these people are in this condition. And they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. Like I said, those who will come with flattery and smooth talk and smooth tongued people with lots of words, watch out. Especially when those words don't line up with scripture. Even in the church, false teachers, false prophets, false pastors, false apostles. I don't know how many donkeys walking around saying, I'm an apostle. Verse 17. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, it's already been spoken. We don't need new apostles anymore. The apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, they did what they did. They wrote the scriptures down for our benefit. And that's it. When the last word of the book of Revelation says, Amen, that's it. There's no more apostles after that. The apostle laid the foundation. They left. They are with Jesus. Twelve of them. That's it. And they did their job. They have been very effective. Nobody needs to recreate or come up with new revelation or new divine interpretation of the Bible. The apostles have already laid the foundation. Now you study the scriptures and you understand from the scriptures what the apostles said and learn it and obey it. All these fake apostles running around, tell them to go to the hospitals and start healing the sick. If they can't do that, they can't lay hands on the people with coronavirus and heal them, then they are not apostles. They are fake they are messengers of Satan. Verse 18. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause division not having the spirit. So there are only two types of people in the world. Those who are the seed of the woman and those who are the seed of the serpent. Those who are with God and those who are against God. There is no neutrality. So understand that. God is looking for those that will be obedient to him all the way until the end. And the seed of the serpent, the children of wrath, the children of disobedience will come against you. They will attack you. They will be mockers and scorners and grumblers and complainers and whiners. They are the children of wrath. You're not called to keep company with them. Wicked people, dogs, sorcerers, nasty pigs. That's not your company. Find through believers. Find the sheep and stay safe with the sheep because the shepherd is with the sheep. And the father of lies, Satan, is with the children of wrath. He is the prince of the power of the air. He has power in this world. He is influencing millions of people to be deceived and they will be led to the slaughter. They will run to the Antichrist. The apostasy will take place, which is already happening right now. The falling away from the faith. And they're falling into the hands of Antichrist. The separation has already taken place. The sheep and the goat. Goats. It's a separation that's already taken place. Don't try to mix those two together. God has already separated. And he's coming back to collect his bride. And he's coming back to judge the goats and the pigs and the dogs. So this is a time to really examine yourself. To really seek out God. To really say, Lord, get rid of all the junk in my life, all the wicked ways, all the nasty ways and attitudes and all the petty stuff and all the little, little stuff that keeps me preoccupied and let me purify my soul. Let me come before you. Let me truly serve you, Lord, so that when you return, you will say, well done, good and faithful servant. So let us pray. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for letting us understand your word and then to be able to apply it so that we will be faithful witnesses until the end 
to walk in the power of your Holy Spirit and not to allow evil to overtake us. And even if we have to die for our faith, that in these times, in this season, when the Antichrist is revealed, we will get to see what that looks like. And then the true Christians will be revealed and those that are fake Christians will be exposed. And that is part of the reason why the Antichrist will come. He will separate the true from the fake Christians. Because the fake ones will bow down to Antichrist and they will not have the courage and the boldness to stand up against evil. But help us to have that overcoming spirit, to have the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome Satan through the blood of Jesus and through the word of our testimony. Make us strong and faithful witnesses until the end. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.